So hello everyone, my name is Jilvanas. I'm a kind of founding engineer at KSTI. Currently position is a bit different, but uh, today I'm gonna try to talk about uh, Kubernetes workload auto scaling and performance dimensions. I have uh, worked with Kubernetes uh, for like uh, multiple years. Around 2016 is when I started using it. At first it was like more from the user land perspective and recent years a uh, bit more advanced scenarios and uh, yeah, I will try to share my learnings, experiences, incidents and information from like different customers goals we had and how we approached various different scenarios. So yeah, this is just a, a slide for uh, advertising for YouTube, so maybe algorithms will match me better later on. This is just my dog and yeah, let's move on. <laughs> So just to understand who is in the audience, because there's plenty of you guys, uh, I'm first time here, so I have no clue like what kind of background people are here. So a couple of questions for me. Can you raise your hands uh, for people who are using Kubernetes at work or like playing with it and these kind of things? Oh, okay, so I'm screwed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, can people keep the hands for ones who ever had some performance issues, had to pick between different VM types, uh, experience downtimes due to that. Okay, so plenty, <laughs> plenty. And yeah, not using Kubernetes at all, but like uh, using applications in cloud environment, which requires anyway setting with different VM types or like servers and these kind of things. Okay, few. So yeah, let's move on then. So the context for today is uh, to understand the organizational challenges everyone has, how engineering is in interacting with business and uh, because all of us uh, have similar goals, and the goal is to kind of uh, make sure we are delivering quality products with, uh, from time to time, pushback from the customers and from us pushing back to the customers in terms of like what kind of requirements need to be implemented and all of these other things not in order not to create too much tax depth for your company and uh, yeah, kind of like try, try to have a good engineering practices with a certain love for the customers. And at the same time, there is... <laughs> conflicting things such as avoiding business critical incidents, which means if you're experimenting too much, you'll have some issues and these issues consist both from bugs, from performance uh, problems, from how you pick different VM types in the cloud environment, uh, where you lack automation, observability, and all these kind of similar things. And nowadays, one of the main topics, I guess, actually limiting spend on the infrastructure which is becoming as critical as making sure that your code runs fine because especially if you are a startup, spending too much money usually means you might run out of business because getting financing these days is a bit harder, so lots of different challenges. And these, uh, these gifts are not chosen by coincidence. Usually that's how interaction might look like for some where manager is someone who is drinking coffee and like uh, complaining for you to finish this feature on time and like engineer someone who is like uh, in the start of delivering great products, uh, trying to make use of nice fans, fancy stack tools and uh, improvise on performance and all these kind of things. So, but the goal is common. All of these departments, different kinds of people need to work in sync to deliver both the quality, the performance and everything for your product. So this is kind of like a clickbait article I found like last week. Uh, the point of that is like, especially at the bigger corporates, people, at least in USA, are having various fears that like, uh, due to increasing cloud costs, uh, some jobs might be lost because in a company organization of like 6,000 people or so, because this is what, what survey was done for. If you like consider that cloud spends on that kind of size of organization are increasing, it means like you can easily like lay off one department and like save enough money to sustain yourself for longer. But yeah, this is just a click bit. <laughs> So decision, decision, decisions. Uh, the thing in Kubernetes world and same like whatever you do with VMs, you need to understand that like whatever you're working with, you would usually have different resources to act on. It might be ingress, egress network bandwidth, it might be CPU, memory, ephemeral storage, uh, GPUs or whatever other fancy thing you might get. And uh, yeah. In no way I'm expert on the network bandwidth, but uh, in this talk I will give example how we tackled that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, and one example I usually like to make in this scenario that uh, one CPU is not one CPU the same way one calorie is not one calorie, meaning like you can eat sugar, sugar for one calorie, or you can eat like some proteins and the 
output of that is completely different. Your body acts differently. You consume energy differently. So similar way in Kubernetes, just setting one CPU or setting two gigab gigabytes of memory doesn't mean that it will act the same. Your application will work the same. And like at the end of the day, you will be able to sustain your business to continue with request per second metrics uh, according to your SLAs and these kind of things. Yeah, I'm gone. So this is just a random benchmark I found for some of the Azure VMs, and the goal behind that is just to show that like all VMs are born differently, especially in different cloud environments. Every half a year or like a year, cloud provider releases new VMs. We usually include new generation of uh, CPUs, and we usually outperform the previous generation because like there is lots of technical improvements that happened in these uh, chips over the year, two year period or, or more, and like uh, it usually results in better performance. And cloud providers also then are selling these VMs for usually cheaper price, at least in my experience. And similar, uh, similar benchmarking was done for MongoDB. This is not done by me, just a, a chart from the internet. The slides that are linked will, will have information more about it. But the idea is that if you are like running MongoDB on Kubernetes cluster, you're deploying it on certain VM just by switching to different family. You can find out different performance right away, both for reads and for hidden update scenarios. Let me just get some water. And uh, why do you need to care about that? Because like, as I mentioned, like cloud providers release VMs like every half a year or a year. And like, if you are a big uh, organization, you have hundreds of clusters, you probably have hundreds of node groups and you typically would go around, upgrade them or like leave uh, them running for quite, quite some amount of time, which means you're losing money, which means you're losing performance, which means like you're just not benefiting of all the technological advances that are happening like uh, across every year. Yeah, so same statement from AWS, newer VMs are better, and if you like look at any of them announcements, you would see that like some of them has CPU chips, which are better, as I mentioned, but some of them also leverage performance boosts from like getting better DRAM memory and like other things improved as well. Okay. So obviously what I'm trying to make a point for is that uh, VM is not the same VM and all the categories of VMs can be different use cases when you take into account different instance families, when you take into account different VM, different applications that need to use them. So like at the end of the day, you have a matrix of things you need to operate on, which uh, my, in my opinion, it's not reasonable, reasonable for a human to do that. Yeah, and in, GCP scenario, it's even more work than my case, I would believe so. Not sure how many of you use GCP environment, but like typically when you're like scheduling VMs and GCP, you have options to choose such a CPU platform. And that thing is a very tricky one because automatic might feel that the cloud provider will do the right thing for you and will pick the best CPU architecture that is available. Somewhere online I have read that we are supposed to pick the CPU architecture, which actually is the most performing one based on real world scenarios we encountered, it just picks whatever is available in the data center. And it might mean that instead of getting like Skylake or some newer CPU architecture, you will end up with Haskell from like 2013. And you can imagine that like in few years of technological advances, these CPU chips have different performance metrics. They operate differently. And out of nowhere, you might see like 20, 30% of impact for your application performance uh, when you're running in the cloud environment. So. Lots of things for you to monitor for, lots of things to track on, and like, yeah, depending on cloud provider, you have different issues for that. Okay, so what can we do? So obviously what can we do? We can try forecasting issues on applications that we are building. This is just an example diagram uh, for what could happen. Like when you have a downtime, it just uh, cuts off uh, requests per second in one of our services. And uh, there are a few things that you need to do when you want to avoid issues in, in some of these cases. You need to make sure that you're not packing most applications together, especially with CPU network and all these other similar things. You want to probably avoid throttling as well. So like if you have two noisy network applications running in the same VM, it might mean that one of them will increase load immensely and like it would cause network congestion and like other applications might suffer from latency and all these other things. 
And for memory, like of course, like if you lack memory, you will just get application killed, and uh, you can then go as an SRE, as a DevOps, or, or whoever, like go update request limits, uh, try to do that during 3 a.m. in the morning, and you'll probably enjoy that so much. So, <laughs> yeah. And any other kind of disruptions, which I would be interested to hear from you, like after we talk. So, what do you think your application needs? And that question itself is kind of an interesting one especially like spending the last uh, four years being exposed quite a lot of to the customers. You have customers who are very, very advanced. We have DevOps uh, communities, we have SREs, we kind of like dig in and out of Kubernetes in the trenches out and et cetera. But like you have the ones who are just starting the journey on that engine or orchestrator or how you want to call it. And these ones are usually a bit more funnier in terms of like how we approach a situation where we throw every possible restriction at their applications and everything should work, but at the same time, it should be 100 replicas, we should be cheap, we should be storage optimized, we should be memory optimized, GPU, high I.O. throughput, uh, big network throughput, it should be able to land on the moon, and uh, yeah, it should be a cheap infrastructure so the company can still outlast uh, on another like one or two years until it gets another financing round. So. A network throughput is kind of highlighted for a purpose here because like uh, we had a couple of incidents on our end regarding that as well. We had written applications to help us solve that and trying to automate that. And I will try to show a, a quick demo how, how we observe that and how we can do it, that observability as well. So yeah, I will just quickly mention it. So, yeah. so basically we have this component which is called Quasar. it's completely public. The idea behind that is uh, it's using eBPF and contract, it tracks your network traffic so you can actually pinpoint which application is using how much of bandwidth and uh, the QR code is, code is just to kind of for you to have a direct link to the repo, slides are attached so you can, whenever you want you can find them. The idea behind this thing is that uh, we have this uh, wiser agents running in the cluster. It's a daemon set, meaning it's running in every, v every VM. It's collecting metrics on your network traffic and it's sending that to the ClickHouse that is running within that cluster. So all of these components open source, ClickHouse you can use as well. So like, yeah. And in the GitHub there is a whole example how you can achieve the same. And uh, the thing with that is, just give me a second, let me see if we have uh, Grafana port forward. Okay. Yeah. Now Grafana, once you have this application running, it starts collecting tons of metrics. And in this case, like it's just uh, my made up Grafana dashboard where you have access to different information like what kind of namespace, what kind of kind of the object, uh, workload name, total traffic uh, transmitted, total traffic received. And like you are kind of being able to track how your applications are doing in terms of network traffic. And like, yeah, you can have aggregates or whatever. So it's the data is in ClickHouse, so you can slice and dice it how you want. You can pin down uh, any application you want. So in this case, like ClickHouse itself is using quite a lot of network traffic for this uh, demo. And the app behind that is just Google Microservices demo where it has like e-commerce app which is fakely generating content in the background so that data is actually increasing, decreasing, and it's not static. So yeah, let me switch back to slides. Yep, switching back to slides. So Google itself also has a similar tool. Issue with that is it it is not being able to pinpoint pods for some reason. The GKE version of it is gonna get, become enterprise feature, which is not, will not be available for other folks in June, in June or July. I don't remember which date, but we have tried to use that. It didn't work out for us too good, so, and our own was built uh, way before that, so. Yeah, these were just uh, slides to make sure uh, if the demo doesn't work or internet is down, I can show something, so. This is just a basic query from ClickHouse, looks quite like SQL and uh, yeah, a bunch of data available within your cluster. You slice and dice it and you, you have it. So yeah, let's skip, let's skip, and skip. So yeah, getting back to the goals. 
So the goal of this talk, again, for me, is to kind of try to convince you that uh, you always need to make sure that you're doing correct vertical sizing of your applications, and that means understanding how much resources your application needs. But then if you take into account the restrictions which I previously mentioned for different VM times and the performance, again, the dimensions you need to take care of explodes quite a lot. So then, again, you need to make sure that you know prop how many replicas your application needs to have, what is the application type, what is VM that will best fit it, is it CPU memory optimized, and the goal is to kind of say that you, you should not do measure once but cut twice, but you should do measure constantly and cut often, which means you kind of like need a bunch of different strategies to automate that because in the long term, especially as your company scale or if it's already like enterprise scale company, just not feasible or you will have like big departments of people just taking care of your uh, data centers. So this is just a basic example of one of our production applications where it's kind of visible that for CPU usage, the, it's the same application, it has like, I don't know, 20 replicas or so, but this is just two different replicas picked in the Grafana dashboard to show that like uh, even the load between them is not equal and it might be quite different due to like uh, what kind of VM is being used behind the scenes, but for some of these things it's... Uh, Sometimes okay to use the cheaper one to just save on some money, but uh, if it would be a critical one, it would not be. So similar situation for the network thingies, or for, or sorry, for memory thingies, and yeah, network as well. So we always try to kind of dig into the data, see, see what's used, and see how we can like automate that in our company. And yeah, for replicas, it's kind of similar story. And in that green line, you can see that like we had a huge spike, uh, which got uh, that replica to kind of close to 40 replicas for that application. And uh, why this happened? We had a small downtime, application went down, queue built up. Once application started spinning up again, it had lots of catching up to do. And that catching up means uh, you need to upscale that application during that time catch up on the backlog of tasks that needs, need to be handled, and then you can carry on with your day-to-day -day business. So the impact timeline is very small, but, but if we had like no KIDA configured for that on the CPU and other resources, it would have cost potential longer downtime for our customers where SLAs would not have been met. So yeah, point I'm trying to make, uh, another one is that resources are not infinite and side effects are painful, so just to reiterate, for CPU limit, you will get like throttling, which might mean less request per second. For memory, you, your application will get killed. For network, you will get too much latency. Or if it is network congestion, it might be that different teams' application will get network congestion and they will have latency, but your team might be just fine, which happened in one of the scenarios that I will talk about in a few minutes. And GPU similar situation, if it's GPU for computing versus GPU memory, you will have different effects on what you run out of. And why this happens? Because applications have a lifespan, and, like, uh, and that lifespan might include not just good engineering practices, but something that like you did the setup a few years back. It, I think this one is from some of our Prometheus environments. And as the load grows, as the company grows, as the new teams start adding more metrics to your Prometheus stateful sets and all these other things, the load grows and you need to make sure you adjust your Prometheus infrastructure, make sure your, the request limits are set correctly, and yeah. And not to just name engineering challenges, engineers nowadays, probably this guy who is laughing in the front, have heard the FinOps term, and uh, Engineers need to wrestle with the FinOps, but you kind of uh, yeah, try to be friends with them as well because we have certain, how to say, implications for your company and their finances. For us, that is that, you, that your company gets more visibility on the spends, uh, more financial accountability is thrown across the teams, and you have more transparency. But the big cons of that is that Everyone gets huge extra pressure when we are building new features, when we think how to refactor everything because if the matrix of auto-scaling resources and et cetera was growing up previously when we discussed that, if you throw FinOps and taking care of these financial demands and every decision you make, well, I guess you, you get even more complexity for the decisions, but yeah. And being frugal is kind of relative term, so even in our company, like the frugality of uh, what we consider 
good enough cheap or good enough expensive is very different. And uh, yeah, we had scenarios where we would by accident nuke the, everyone's dev environment just because we tried to kind of save not running these VMs for like extra one hour, which kind of means we spent extra one hour for everyone doing their setup on the features we were testing and like whatever we were working on. So that frugality doesn't necessarily mean you will save something, it might mean you will create even greater impact. And potential conflicts and blame. So that might happen if you have too much visibility and you have people who are not culturally fit for your company. They are blaming you based on the spends, but they're not understanding the whole scenario of like how we got there. Because again, startup or enterprise, there will be certain tech depth, certain decisions that were made. The RPMs agreed to maybe take a shortcut or such. And uh, yeah, you need to be mindful of what's happening. So getting back to the production incident topic and like uh, most of you probably had that 3 a.m. call at some point in your career. And that might have happened due to all of the slides which I showed previously, uh, meaning that it might have ha happened because you picked wrong VMs for your application. It might have happened because the application ran out of memory. It might have happened because you wrestled with FinOps guy and at the end of that, uh, V1 and the uh, output of that was that you took a shortcut to save some money, but we didn't save the request per second uh, thing for, for your application. Well, shit happens. Uh, we make mistakes. We stay to st try to learn from them and stay composed. Of course, composure should be happening to some extent because if everything around you is burning and you're about to die, you should probably run, not just keep drinking coffee. So one of... Uh, few examples uh, that we had in our past was like one of the workers which queued up and that uh, application was responsible for downloading data from Google Cloud Storage. And that data kind of consisted of huge blobs of JSON from like 250 megabytes to like half a gigabyte. And we had an application which was not considered mission critical at that point. It was experimental feature we were building. And that replica went down. We didn't care too much. The team was working at their own pace to kind of fix it up because there were no customers using that. And it so happened that at the same VM, there was another application running which was business critical. And because uh, that experimental application had to caught up on some work once it was fixed, it started downloading gigabytes of data from the Google Cloud Storage, caused network congestion, and the business critical application and their clients had like a 10 minute impact or so, but it basically meant we were not able to fulfill our SLAs for our customers. And yeah, we had to do a postmortem and understand how we got there and like uh, why we as a company, which we are like promoting optimization, automation and et cetera, why we failed to pick the right VMs for our own use cases. So yeah, this is example number one. And second one was, uh, also quite a small blip uh, for the picking suboptimal VMs during the similar JSON processing. But in that case, it was that it was very early in the company stage where we had different VM times running. So one was N1 and another was C2D. People who, using, who are using Kubernetes will probably, not Kubernetes, who are using DCP will probably know that N1 VM family is kind of shared CPU one. It's not the best machine family to use. And also it's general purpose one as opposed to compute optimized the CDD. So it, we were split for this replica, so this application across shared CPU general purpose VMs and like actually compute optimized VMs. And uh, then the blip happened in, in the how we handled it and the queue built up, we were not able to kind of process it in time because the N1 machine eight CPUs are not actual eight CPUs. And even adding to that, we are slower than the ones in C2D. So like, So the thing is still to understand that all of us are in the same boat. Uh, these are just a couple of examples. As an industry, we try to innovate. Uh, we try to move fast, to break things, and to improve. And uh, incidents will happen. We need to make sure that some of the learnings we can automate and like not to get back to these problems. But uh, another thing we need to, to, to make sure is that uh, if the company requires certain pace of innovation, there is no way you are you will avoid incidents overall. Like something will happen, and like as long as you manage to make postmortems, you manage to make them blameless, you manage to note down what kind of uh, steps got you there, how you can improve them in the future, you should be fine. And yeah, so how does one solve it? As I mentioned, I believe automation is an answer to all of the problems which I just mentioned. 
but it is not an easy way thing to do, especially not for human. And these are just one of the end decisions and things uh, you need to take care of when deploying something, running in production. And we, all of these questions are something you need to ask yourself, your colleagues, and et cetera. And many tools, we can talk about it. Some of them are open source, some not. So I don't want to do some shameless plugs about any products. And uh, yeah, we can, you can catch me after this talk and you can discuss how we did this. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the time. Uh, there's, some, there's still time for questions and answers. And this is QR code to the slides, so you can check them out if uh, you need it.